Okay, welcome everybody to tonight's city council meeting. The council chamber is open to the public at 100% capacity. Today's Wednesday, March 16, 2022. Before tonight's invocation, I would like to honor and recognize a local leader that we lost unexpectedly last Friday evening. City of Fowler Mayor David Cardenas. David served on the city council for 21 years, including the past 12 years as mayor. David was well known for running his Fowler business, Dave's Auto, for decades, his community service and his activism in his church. He was well known to all of us on council, serving as a friend and mentor. We extend our sincere condolences to his family and to the entire city of Fowler. Please join me by honoring David with the moment of silence. Thank you for that moment of silence. Tonight's invocation will be given by Pastor John Palms, Community Kingsburg Task Force, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, John. You guys, just before I say anything, I wanted to say that I, you know, looking around this group of people who are leaders in our city, I just really appreciate who you are. It's a pleasure just to come here and, and do an invocation for you. But I just want to say that I, you know, brings me smiles to my face when I see you. So let me pray. Father, I just thank you for these people here who have shown amazing responsibility for a lot of the growth and the maturity in our city and our city of Kingsburg. Lord, they make decisions on based on what they believe is best. You've given them abilities and talents. By making efforts and taking risks, they learn how to best handle these those talents. I, Lord, I bless them in their efforts and their willingness to take risks. I pray they will seek ways to con continue to seek ways to encourage the men in our city to learn to be true husbands and fathers. They figure out ways to guard where our children are being taught in school. They pursue helping our youth through restorative justice. They help children learn to take responsibility rather than seeking entitlement. Father, I bless them in the ways that they look to enhance our financial future and that they look for ways to guard our, t our health in times of the pandemic. God, what I, um, what I just see is this, this is a growing city. Lord, it's, a, it's growing in terms of its maturity and its willingness to really help each of the individuals in the city. And so, God, I, I know this is a time of real, uh, real challenge in our nation, in our, uh, in our world. And, Lord, I just bless these people as they sit here on a weekly or every other week basis, Lord, to say, what do we do? How do we do to help grow our city and help it be safe and a place for growth for the citizens who live here? So, God, I bless them in those efforts, and I congratulate them on taking the time and effort to do that, taking of their, again, of their um, individual abilities and talents and putting those to use here. So, God, thank you, and I pray this all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Can we have roll call, please? Present. Here. Here. Next, we uh, approve agenda action by council to approve the agenda or to make modifications. Items that can be added to the agenda is constrained by state law. I'll make that motion. I will second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Presentations tonight, we have none. Public comments. This is time for any citizen to come forward and address the city council on any issue within its jurisdiction that is not listed on the agenda. A maximum of five minutes is allowed for each speaker. Anybody um, out there like to have public comment, make a public comment tonight? Yes. Okay, come on up. If you could please state your name and if you're a Kingsburg resident. Yes, I'm in Volkerman Village, and my name is Gary Myrie. Gary uh, what we came here to talk, myself and another resident, uh, came here to talk about the 
uh, feral cats that are running crazy all over the place. And we'd like to know if there's anything that the city can do to help us, to, to capture them, do something with them so that they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're leaving their mark on, on uh, all sorts of furniture, your porches, your cars, and things like that. And it's just unbelievable. And there is, uh, every day you'll, you'll see two or three uh, cats going across the, the road. And uh, don't know them all, don't know anything about it, but we do have people who are feeding them they're not supposed to. The uh, Volcom Village, they're in their pamphlet, they have a, a provision that says that people basically are not supposed to be feeding, feeding them, but there's, there are people that do. And uh, we, have the, we have talked to the manager, Larry, and we have ta and uh, he has talked to one lady, or, or yeah, one, one lady who is feeding them. And her answer to him was, when they stop the train whistle at three o'clock in the morning, I'll stop feeding the cats. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> how do you fight it? <laughs> how do you even address it? <laughs> But we do have signed signatures of, of people who have, who we've gone around and said, you know, this is what we're trying to do. And we we did go to the city, uh, the, the police department, and ask them, and they suggested this this would be the next step is come here. So that's why we're here today. Or that's why I'm here along with my uh, the lady who lives across the street from me, Nancy. But if you can help, that's what we're looking for. Any type of help. Just to, like it says, even if you leave, you leave your window open in your car, you could get cats to come in there because they're looking for uh, shelter and or food or anything like that. And, it, and you surely don't want these, the smell to be stuck in your car. So that, that's what we're asking. Like I said, it's just, it, I don't know if the city can do anything, but it's better than not having anything at all. Okay, yeah, thank you. We, we can't comment on, on this item for, you know, that you're worried about, but we can direct it to city staff. That's, a, yeah. that's we're starting. That's, yes. a, <laughs> that's what we want to do, just get started, and hopefully something could be done about it. You okay, thank you. you I'll give you my card here, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, follow up. We do have a program that we can help you out with. Oh, yeah, that, that would be really, really appreciated. Yeah. Because I know there was one that uh, they were taken, they uh, uh, captured cats, and then they took them and had them fixed. Correct. Mm -hmm. But my thing is if you fix them, can you take them somewhere other? <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, we can't. We're a little constrained by that, but uh, there are. Uh, we, can, we can talk. We'll talk about it and give you some options. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks Thank for you. Coming Thank in. you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other citizens that would like to make public comment tonight? No. Okay. I'll close public comment. Next, we have consent calendar. Items considered routine in nature are to be placed on consent calendar. They will be considered as one item and voted upon in one vote unless individual consideration is requested. Each vote in favor of consent calendar is considered and recorded as a separate affirmative vote in favor of each action listed. Tonight we have 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, Five point four, five point five, five point six, and five point seven. Does any council member want to pull one of these items? I don't. Is yeah. there any staff at the public? Yeah. Any um, anybody in the public want to pull one of these items? No. Okay. Then we can get a motion to approve. I will make that motion. 
I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, motion carries. Next, we have regular calendar 6.1. Public hearing 2020 census, Kingsburg City Council redistrict, redistrict, redistricting. Presentation by Jeff Tilton, National Demographics Company. Hey, good evening uh, again, uh, Council and uh, members of the audience who uh, may have seen this now for the fourth time. And we are open for public hearing. I was yes. going to ask you, Mayor yes. Pro Tem, if you wanted to do that first. Open public hearing presentation by Jeff uh, Jeff Tilton. Thank you, Jeff. You're very welcome. So, uh, yeah, so here we are the fourth time. So with apologies for those who've already seen this uh, presentation, already three by law, I need to, to go through this. Um, so uh, over the course of time, and I know you were struggling, we're saying redistricting, it does happen, but uh, good for you. Um, you don't have to do this again for 10 years. So... Um, yeah, this, there's a silver lining there. So as part of this process, we have to we had to have a minimum of four uh, public hearings. The first two were before any draft maps were uh, submitted or provided to council, and then the last two, or at least two, were what we call draft map hearings. And this is the fourth one, and hopefully the final one for tonight. So we started back September 1st, and uh, we had those two public hearings to essentially educate the public on the process and to solicit, solicit input uh, from members of the public with respect to what are the neighborhoods in your community um, and what are some of the communities of interest in your, in your city and maybe questions on some of the mapping tools that folks uh, had an opportunity to uh, participate with. Uh, as we have been living this life of pandemic, uh, the census was delayed. Um, we finally got the census data August 12th. Uh, which meant absolutely nothing for California because California took the census data numbers and adjusted it based on its prisoner population in the state prison system. How much that impacted uh, the city of Kingsburg, I have no idea. Maybe the chief knows, uh, but um, it may have been zero. Uh, other jurisdictions uh, may have been impacted greatly uh, with, their, with their actual census data. So when we're talking about uh, jurisdictions, uh, going through this process, it's, Counties and cities, school districts, health districts, water districts, any uh, jurisdiction that has a body that's elected goes through this process. So uh, I brought before you the uh, Zoom, or I think it was Zoom, uh, back in February, um, some draft maps. Um, I will share those again tonight, not in great detail, because you made a decision on focusing on two maps going forward. The uh, intention for tonight is to uh, draft a map. If you draft one of the maps that you um, asked to move forward for tonight, there's really no discussion on sequencing because nothing changes uh, in that respect. Uh, and then uh, for, hopefully you'll adopt a resolution to support the uh, moving forward. So when, when we're talking about uh, redistricting, we have to follow certain rules. And there's federal laws that and our intention is to try to create districts within the city of equal population. Uh, and we use the, the census data, in this case, California prison adjusted data, uh, to try to accomplish that. Um, we can have a 10% a, a deviation in doing this process, and I'll show you what that means in a second. Uh, we must follow the Federal Voting Rights Act. We don't want to have any discriminatory practices in this process, in essence. And we want, a no racial gary we want no racial gerrymandering. Um, <laughs> Then we shift to California, and under the Fair Maps Act, we have to, in this particular order, and every, everything starts with, to the extent practical, that we want to have geographically contiguous districts. Uh, and you'll see that you have that. Uh, we want to, to the extent practical, not divide neighborhoods or not to divide communities of interest. Uh, we want to have easily identifiable boundaries, uh, and we want our districts to be compact. Um, and we shall not favor or discriminate against a political uh, party. If we can do the items in, in the left column and the items in the center column, then we can consider some of those items in uh, on the far right column, especially looking at respecting voters' choices, uh, who they elected, they elected you, uh, et cetera. Um, so one of the key things here is you're going to see draft maps. Folks in the public might be seeing them for the first time. It's not as simple as saying, hey, let's just put a line here and over there, and this will create a district. We have to use census blocks. And uh, census blocks, 
Well, in the Central Valley, a lot of census blocks are going to be squares and rectangles. Um, but there are some funky-looking census blocks, and that uh, determines how a particular district's going to look. Um, so I just want to mention that in case someone says, well, why can't we do it this way or that way? So uh, these were the questions we asked. What is your neighborhood? What is your community of interest? Uh, we got a minimal response on that. But we did have uh, seven draft maps for council. Uh, five are what we call viable maps. Uh, two, uh, public 102, its deviation was 12.48, which is above 10%. So it's, you really can't take it into consideration. And it was not contiguous. It had holes. Uh, and then uh, public map 105 is 16.75% uh, deviation. Um, how we get that deviation number is uh, we're, we're going to look at a table in every of the every five of the five districts rather, and how what's the percentage they are are off on a, the equal population ideal target number, and then you add the highest number positive number and the highest negative number and you get the deviation. Uh, so we want to keep that under ten. So you can see uh, we had we had some ones all the way up to nine point zero six, etc. Also want to point out, as I mentioned last time, to thank all the individuals who submitted maps from the public. I mean, it takes time. It takes forethought. Uh, obviously, they're invested in this process, and, and thank you. So uh, this is what I call the council advance. This is my terminology. Uh, the deviation for uh, NDC 201 was 6.36%. Uh, when you see it has uh, two Latino CVAP districts, that means citizen voting age population majority. So it's more than 50% plus one in uh, those two districts. In this case, would be districts one and, and five. Uh, this particular draft map does not pair any council members. So if you chose this one, there's no sense talking about election sequencing because it stays status quo. NDC 202 uh, shows that deviation of 7.3. Same thing with citizen voting age population. Again, citizen voting age population is not necessary necessarily registered voters, they're eligible to vote, okay? So they may not be uh, registered, they may not have even voted, but they're 18 plus. Uh, same thing in districts one and five, and there are no council members paired. So as part of the public hearing and your discussion, um, these are the two maps that you had me uh, bring forward to you tonight. Uh, you can always make a change. Uh, once you vote for whatever you do, and then do your resolution, and you're good, and you'll see me in 10 years. I'll be 70, but you'll see me in 10 years. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, council discussion on these maps. Let me have a comment, concern. I don't think I have any concern at all. I think they're very similar maps. The only mm -hmm. real changes that I see are very slight, and it's with, between 1, 4, and 3. Representing three, I like uh, NDC 202 more. I just like how it comes down and you end up getting part of downtown represented in three. So part of downtown has two representations then from council. Um, that's my biggest reason for preferring 202 is just to get a portion of downtown to two separate districts. So it has more representation that way. I really don't have a preference between 201 to 202. Very and if that's, yeah, if, like, if you're saying you like that, you know, there's going to be um, four and three in 202, you said, in downtown? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have any reason to not want to choose 202 if that's something that you're wanting to see, right? Because, like, for me, for District 1, it's still majority of the west side of town. The only difference between 201 to 202 is that in District 1 and 201, it's um, there's this little there's this little piece where it says like Laurel Street and Simpson Street. So there's that little piece that's different between the two. But um, I've been representing half the half the side and then all up into the other. So you know, I really think that if you're leaning with 202, I wouldn't mind um, picking that one because I really. There's hardly any differences. Yeah, I agree. I know that when we had, went over this last meeting, the, we wanted to try and keep 
the district similar, you know, that that the city picked, the council picked, what was it, four years ago? Yeah, so I think either one of these is good. Um, I don't have a preference either of, if you like 202, Brandon, you know, that's good with me. For me, it, they both are, I think, exactly the same, so for my district right now, either one of those. But, yeah, that, that's a good point, though, that two, uh, two council members would have some representation on, on the city here, city businesses. Any other discussion? Oh, you have something? No, I just, I can't. My page is all wrinkled. Oh. So I can't see anything. Look up there, no. I, well, I want to see them. <laughs> I have good eyes just because I'm old. Um, I was just going to ask, so for between here. 2 and 3, they, thank you. Welcome. Between 2 and 3 and, and 2 and 1 and 2 and 2, um, don't they both rep have representation in downtown? What did you? What did you they don't. Oh. Two hundred one goes see. straight down straight or straight down Eighteenth. Uh, Two hundred two it comes around by where the hospital. Oh, uh, gotcha, gotcha. Just that bottom. It's hard to see. It's there again. Yeah. Oh, so strange. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I just wanted all, clarification on that. All the deviations are well within guidelines. There's no mm -hmm. CVAP district variations. There's no. Uh, it's. When I, when I look, I spent a lot of time looking at both of these, and that's the only real difference that I've seen. And splitting hairs, it's just selfishly, I'd like to see downtown have more representation. Oh, I think that's good. That's a good point. Yeah, so, um, with that, can we? Well, uh, we'd like, like to separate? open the, oh. open for public comment on uh, the redistricting. Would anybody like to? Yeah, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> hey, darling. I'm a resident. Yeah, I can write number two. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Hey, we've got public comment. Nobody else. That's public awesome. comment. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have any comments on this? Ten I am... years. It's a commitment. Okay, then. Well, <laughs> close public comment. Continue city council discussion. Selecting the final map. Sure am. I'll make the motion to select map NDC 202. And I will second that motion. Okay, I'll close public public hearing. Um, possible action is. Wait. I'm sorry, say I had, I had to close uh, okay. the public hearing. So, I'm sorry. Can you say it again? Yeah. Brandon? I'll make the motion to adopt NDC 202 as our redistricting map. And I will second that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Motion carries. We're good. Um, so we now need a motion to adopt resolution 2022-021. I'll make that motion. <laughs> and I will second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nope. Okay. That motion also carries. Thank you. Thank you yeah, so thank much. You. So are we actually done with redistricting now? Is it like yeah, we're done. It. That was it. Share the rest. We'll work with the register of voters' office and all that. I appreciate thank you. you. Thank so you much. very much. Yeah. What thank you, Jeff. That's, a, that's a good thing to be passed. Yeah, it is. Done. Ten years. <laughs> Let's <three> did it. <laughs> okay, next we have 6.2. Kingsburg Tri-County Hospital District Grant Policy and Grant Application. Staff report, staff report by Community Services Director Adam Castaneda. Presentation by Director of Administrative Services Christina Windover. And Fire Chief Daniel Perkins. Good evening, Mr. Mr. Mayor Pro Temp and members Hello, of Chief. Council. Okay, so tonight you have the uh, staff report sitting in front of you specifically about the Kingsburg Tri-County Healthcare District Grant. Uh, I'll make this as short and sweet as possible. The executive summary is very well stated by uh, Director Castaneda. Grants are awarded for purpose allowed by law, including to aid the operation of free clinics, health education programs, wellness and prevention programs, rehab, and any other health care which is necessary for the maintenance of good physical and mental health in Kingsburg community. 
So having said that, each year the preference will be given to specific projects. And this year's themes for the hospital district specifically were mental and physical health care, nutrition, exercise, and diabetes. So those were very specific parameters which they wanted to set. So over these last few years, a total of about five years, going back to about 2017, the city's got an estimated about $3 million in grants from the Kingsburg Tri-County Healthcare District. It's been instrumental in many programs within the city. And again, I've, we've been, a, the fire department, as in the we, have been a very uh, healthy recipient of that. And it's been a very lucrative thing for the fire department, as well as the city and many other projects that have been successful, not only for public safety, but also for the betterment of the community, especially when it comes to health. So specifically in relating it to health, one of the items that we worked as a group together uh, for the department heads was one of the issues that had come up early on in my tenure was the status of the uh, Senior Citizen Center kitchen area. Um, far under code, uh, there were many things that were needed in that, in that particularly, but the initial fix was estimated to be in the, in the realm of about $700,000, quite pricey. So that was tabled and rethought about. We did a little more uh, meeting of the minds. And specifically, one of the things that I think is instrumental to understanding the ask in this is before COVID-19 hit, there was a lot of seniors that were being served meals by basically a Meals on Wheels program through FMAAA, the Fresno Madera Agency on Aging. In March of 2020, the city took it upon themselves to do that program because that system ended. So there was no one else feeding that particular segment of society. In that short amount of time from then till now, the city has provided 65,000 meals to seniors. Now put that in perspective. Not only is it 65,000 meals, but those are all cooked at that facility. So again, knowing that we have a non-compliant um, kitchen, I think one of the things we really strived for as a group was to find a solution to this. So we took it upon ourselves to go through this process again, came up with a more viable alternative, which is one of the presentations we have for you tonight for your approval. Uh, the project that we're trying to get moved forward uh, as proposed set is to include the following. Exterior and interior fire door upgrades, roller service window door upgrades, service panel electrical upgrades, fire sprinkler alarm systems for the kitchen only. Uh, mechanical and HVAC duct vent upgrades, compartment kitchen sink, range hood and ducting, range oven and unit, and that that particular price is about $212,568. So much, much more palatable, I think. And overall, I think one of the things that this does affect is the overall health of seniors in our community, which in long range view, ends up affecting the fire department and our emergency responses as well as community risk reduction. So that's the first ask that we would ask for you to approve for us going forward. And the second one um, is the fire department specific ask. And again, speaking to the overall care of where we are in general with the um, rollout of public safety. One of the things we've been trying to do is access other areas and other uh, abilities for us to render care. One of the things we've seen as a, I wouldn't say Achilles heel, but one of the, the struggles we have is accessing areas along the Kings River drainage, as well as the Kings River, as well as other areas that we are by automatic aid agreement and mutual aid agreement responsible to respond to. So a lot of those are inaccessible areas that only are accessible either by foot, four wheel drive vehicle or utility vehicles as we are suggesting here. So one of the things we are suggesting is a utility train vehicle, as well as all the upfitting for that. Um, that particular program and all of its um, concomitant things that go with it is about $125,000. It's basically the utility vehicle, trailer, the other equipment that goes on it. Essentially that vehicle also serves the city in another dual purpose, while it's not doing that particular thing off in the, I guess, boondocks as you might say. Uh, it's able to respond to all of the community events, football games, our Swedish festival, car show. It has a small makeshift ambulance cot on the back, has the ability to respond in small crowds of, of people. It's very nimble, and it's not nearly the uh, 65,000 pound 
ambulance that we've been accustomed to seeing that transports our paramedics and patients. The other additional thing that we wanted to reach out as well and get approval for was the community wellness and outreach program. That particular total cost for that is $70,000. That includes public access, sorry, public AED and CPR courses, smoke and carbon monoxide detection outreach program, public outreach for mental and physical wellness, which is all included in public outreach in general at all of these public events, as well as expansion of our website for the fire department to have greater access for all members of our community, and a healthcare workers physical and mental wellness program working concomitantly with the uh, money that's set aside within the ambulance funding for night calls to have a wellness program, prevention program for the responders that we do have. So those are the two major asks from both departments, uh, one $212,000, the other $195,000. And we would ask that you would uh, grant the ability for us to move forward with that process. Are there any questions? Does your, does that $125,000 include training for your utility vehicle? Absolutely. Includes the training, trailer, uh, additional equipment that has to go on it. And uh, I think the community wellness and outreach is fantastic. I know you guys do a lot of that work already as it is, but that would just look like additional courses and additional things mm -hmm. what, added on to what you already do. Specifically, yes. Specifically, the, the one of the needs we've seen in general is to go literally door to door to community members to ascertain whether they have a working smoke detector, whether they have needs in their homes that we're not aware of, massing all of that data, working with census data, and then moving forward with how do we solve the community's problems that we may not even be aware of. That's, that's awesome. And for that program, um, is that you are going, not you maybe, but your department is going to the doors? Are you going to have volunteers? or? So, like? in, in, so interestingly enough that you ask it, we have a group that graduates uh, Saturday, the mm -hmm. Community Emergency Response Team, Kingsburg, so the CERT volunteers, as they are, and one of the members is here tonight. He, he will be graduating Saturday along with many other people in the community. Uh, we should be graduating 11 of those volunteers. They're working together with KCAPS and the two interns there uh, in conjunction with where they're doing their outreach to reach the people that are either underserved, don't have the ability to reach out, or there's a language barrier or even a digital divide where they don't have access to any of the things that we've become accustomed to, internet, computers. We've got to find a way to reach the people that actually need us. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, on an off note, for that graduation on Saturday, is that a public event or is that um, the test, the testing, The testing is going to be a, a private event, but we're, we're planning on coming to council to actually present to you all of the volunteers that made it through that process and award them their certificates. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Appreciate the hard work put in. Perfect. Thank you very much. Council discussion? Okay. Action deemed as necessary. Do mm -hmm. um, you want us to submit the application based on those? Yes, just looking for direction uh, for staff to submit applications on those two uh, proposed projects, unless there is different direction. I support them all going forward. Mm. Yeah. So you have direction? Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. 6.3, crime statistics report for the month of February 2022 and general police department update crime statistic report prepared by Kinsburg police department records supervisor Karina Padilla presentation by police chief Neil Dadian uh, good evening members of the chief. council good to be with you again uh, so I just wanted to point out a couple of things statistically we seem to be moving in the right direction kind of had a um, eventful start for the first part of the month that seemed to be hopefully an anomaly but we did have some a fair amount of crime 
um, especially when it came to our uh, grand thefts. Uh, I mentioned last time that we made some arrests for uh, catalytic converter thefts, and most of the ones you see in January are those catalytic converter thefts. So we're moving in the right direction. Um, when it comes to the rest of the crime stats, um, I also want to point out to council, if you want to take a look at, I don't know if it's your last page, but it's the, the bar graph for the calls for service. So the last couple of years, they are not where I wanted those to be. Just as a refresher, um, the blue line represents officer-initiated calls, the red line citizen-initiated calls. I want, I want the officer-initiated calls to be higher than the citizen-initiated calls. And, you know, we hit that uh, a few times in 2019 uh, and uh, in 2018 as well. Uh, the pandemic caused us to reverse course, but... Hopefully that, that will continue to um, climb again in 2022 because, again, that's proactivity. The more we're out there getting in front of crime, the less crime that we're going to have. I want to update the council on uh, a couple of – a handful of things from recent months. Uh, we did have a shooting at Coda Lane in number 12. This was last August, I believe. We had three suspects. One is already in custody in prison on unrelated charges, and I've mentioned this prior. Um, and then we're going to be filing charges on him and one other suspect. The, the case has been submitted uh, for a warrant and is processing through the DA's office, so we're, we have made progress on that one. We also had a shooting just uh, at the start of the week on Monday night, Tuesday morning at 8th and Kern in the early morning hours. Uh, that's still under invest investigation. We're tracking suspects uh, via city cameras and um, personal uh, home security cameras. We do have a vehicle, but not a plate, so we're going to send the video out to be digitally enhanced, and we're in contact with the Central California Intelligence Center in Sacramento. Um, which is the th Regional Threat Assessment Center, to ha um, get that done. They, they have the capabilities to do that, and they've helped us on cases in the past. So the video surveillance in the city is really helping us. Um, and, you know, obviously we're going to move in that direction to assist with that um, by building out our own cameras. But, you know, we get a lot of help from our, our residents, they're, and they're more than happy to help us, business owners and residents. So um, that's helped us make a lot of cases. So that's a, that's a nice – it's nice to be able to go to that well and, and get help from our citizens. Um, I want to – I want to bring to your attention a case that I can't talk to you about in detail. It's a child abuse case, but it's unusual. I think it's important that you know some of the different things that we do. So this um, – there was a, a family gathering in another county – and uh, there was a six-month-old child in the care of a relative who accidentally dropped the, the carrier that the child was in. The, the little boy went kind of or somersault over or backwards and had bumped his head. Well, the parents were concerned, obviously. They took the child to um, uh, Valley Children's Hospital. They went through their protocols. The, the child was not injured due to the um, fall, but the doctor found a, what he believed was a prior injury. And again, this is where I, I can't get into details, and I, I hate to be cryptic, but I want to protect, protect confidentialities. Um, they initiated uh, a call to the local law enforcement agency who arrived determined that there was nothing that occurred originally uh, for the parents being there with the child, but that the prior injury needed to be investigated. Since they are residents of Kingsburg, we got a call and we responded. We had the child examined by a specialist um, as part of our investigation, a forensic um, I forget exactly what their title is, but they deal with kids, right? And, a, and a, um, they're specialists in this. And it's been 
we, so we have two differing opinions, the initial doctor who saw the child and then the specialist. So there's two different theories on with whether this was an injury or not an injury, but something that is also common to small children of that age. Um, after several weeks, we completed our investigation and determined that no criminal action had taken place, and so we're not going to be referring that to the DA's office. The Child Protective Services, however, took that child that day mm -hmm. and an older sibling from the parents, and they placed them with other relatives. So, you know, the parents have ac access under supervision. And it's, you know, it's good that they are with some relatives, but that um, CPS is not releasing that child uh, until they have a judicial hearing, which they hope is going to be in June. Nothing we can do about that. The reason I mention this is, you know, everybody thinks of the police as, you know, we're the ones out to arrest people. But it's equally important, you know, we gather facts, and it's equally important for us to not only prove facts of a crime, but to disprove facts of a crime. And in this case, that's what we did. And we think we served the, the interest of the, the small child, of the parents, and the rest of the family. Now, CPS has our protocols. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, it's just unfortunate that a, a judi judicial officer has to make this call, but that's the way the system works. But again, I know that people listen to this broadcast, and you know these are public meetings with public minutes and I, I just want people to understand that you know there's a different facet to what we do we don't only prove that crimes occur we disprove that crimes occur as well so I just wanted to it's so unusual and kind of unique and I certainly haven't run across it in uh, my time here other you know in the past I have certainly but I thought I would bring that before council just to let you know that we're fact finders good bad or indifferent you know our job is to find the facts and and if we can vindicate somebody, we're more than willing to do that as well, not just prove their guilt, but also prove their innocence. Um, one other thing on the crime stats I should have mentioned a minute ago was uh, we had nine DUI arrests for February, which is a little bit unusual for us. Normally we run about four on average a month. So not just a statistical anomaly, an anomaly that's why I thought I'd mention it. Uh, in other news, we have our training plan is back on track, uh, but we're going to be ca playing catch up for the next couple of years. Um, we have exceeded our mandatory training uh, during the COVID period in 2020 and 2021, and we're on track for 2022. But there's other things that I require of the officers. Uh, example, um, everybody will start now attending again the um, Museum of Tolerance training. It's a one-day training down in L.A. At the, at the Museum of Tolerance. And it's really beneficial. Principled policing, which we've started, um, but to a limited degree. Um, why, why'd you stop me training? DX, the escalation tactics. And then some police work kind of technical stuff. Um, everybody goes to basic detective school at some point, probably in year two to three. Uh, we're a little behind on that, um, but that's something that everybody's got to go to. So we're a little, more, a little bit of catching up. Sexual assault investigation, all the officers have to go through that. Child abuse investigation, they all have to go through that. And then uh, some of the things that I want to throw in for them, officer safety and field tactics, things of that nature. So um, we're thankfully COVID is not affecting some of the training that we really need and there it's a little bit slow to get started but uh, we're on our way to making that happen next time i'm going to have uh, some stats for you just an idea of uh, like a snapshot i think i did this last year where it provided a 10-year snapshot so I'll, I'll do the same thing just uh, and i think you'll be happy with the results we're moving in the right direction and then uh, as soon as uh, I answer any of your questions, I'm going to have Barbara Taylor come up, who's one of our police volunteers, and talk to you about our community room. Um, and I'm available to answer any questions if you have any. I'm sorry, family room, not community room. <laughs> I have no questions. No questions, just 
Thanks for keeping crime low in Kingsburg, Chief, you know. <laughs> Our pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, this looks nice. Yeah, he did. Okay. He did. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, as Chief said, I'm Barbara Taylor. I'm a volunteer with the police department. I'm also becoming a chaplain with the police department, so we're two hats there. Um, we, when the police department was built, they created two interview rooms. One's called the hard interview, and the other one's called the soft interview. Well, the hard interview was for the suspects. The soft interview was for the families, or for the victims, pardon me. Well, um, when it was built, a group of women came in from uh, Kingsburg Women, Women's Club, I think is what it's called. Anyway, they came in and painted it. They put in some furniture. We had an extra couch that we'd gotten with some furniture. And they put in a, a small desk and a metal rack. And then they brought in a few little books and crayons and um, stuffed animals. We had stuffed animals coming out of our ears. <laughs> but um, we've managed to, di to distribute the stuffed animals. Um, we also got a bunch of handmade blankets that we've <clears throat> taken the blankets and the bears, put them in bags, and each of the officers have them in their car. So if the situation arises, would it would be beneficial to use one of those, they can. But in the meantime, the chief decided he wanted the family room redone. So I said, I will. <laughs> Always the first to volunteer. And so I recruited my husband to help me, of course. <laughs> and I recruited um, Reggie Gerke to help me. So I was, I was all set. All I had to do was tell him what to do. So, <laughs> and I'm used to doing that. <laughs> so the family room, uh, this is fun. Okay. The family room had very little ch child friendly stuff in it. It was not conducive to children. There was little seating space for people to sit on this small couch. The officers had to use this little desk to do, write the reports. So I went in and I repainted. We took everything out. I repainted, um, did it in purple. So the top half is a light purple and the bottom dark. And then we put a white um, board around the edge. You can see here I got some children's size table and chairs for the kids. Uh, that's Mickey and Minnie waiting for their visitors. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of children through here. It's amazing um, how many children do go through. It's, it's sad, but it's, it's also surprising. I, I added um, the bookshelf. Uh, the book rack, I'm sorry. It's in the, um, I guess I can't point to it. It's in the um, corner of the room. You can't quite see it the way that's situated. It's behind, I'm sorry, it's behind the table. I forgot we moved it. It's behind the table. It's got books that are for children, young children. And um, those, those were bought or borrowed or bought, you know, however I could get books. I, I got kids' books in there. Children's crayons. Um, there's some um, highlights in there for the kids to use. Got new crayons for them. And, um, and it's accessible for almost any child under the age of five, or even at five. I mean, you know, it's, it's child size. Next to that is a sh shelf with plastic bins in it, and we put new toys in there. There's um, Hot Wheel cars, there's Legos. There's, I don't know if you know what these stress things are, the little bubble things that the kids... Uh, Poppets. Poppets, yeah. that's the name. Thank you. We've got a bunch of them in there. Um, that's the mom in the group. <laughs> I'm only a grandma, so I don't deal with that. <laughs> so, um, and we got more books in there and um, crayons, so it's, it's very friendly for the kids. And so they come in. Um, the boards on the wall, there's a magnetic whiteboard and a magnetic chalkboard. The chalkboard's down lower. The kids love that chalk. I got sidewalk chalkboard, so it's nice and bright and intense, so they really like that. The bookshelves on the wall... I put them up higher for the older children that come in, and it has age-appropriate reading material in there. Um, we have um, chicken soup for the teenage soul, and a few other books. There's um, pencils in there, colored pencils, and some of those adult coloring books that they, they have out now. So those two shelves are for the older children. Um, you can see the backpacks there. We have had backpacks donated to the department on different occasions. And we had some left over, and I just put them up there. We can give them to the children or whatever. If we run out of backpacks, we will. Am I in trouble? No. Oh. <laughs> you can show them all that stuff. Oh, oh, I didn't realize it was up close. I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's the one for the, for the teenagers. Um, that's another one for the teenagers. Over here, and there's the magnetic boards. 
on the wall, you see a green alligator. That's called an activity board, I think is what they call it. And it's down low where the little kids can get into it, get play with it, and I understand they've been making good use of it. The white table there is um, move a brown table that the officers can use so they can sit wherever they need to to, to write reports. I'm not sure what's on these. Um, okay, a TV, there's a TV in there. Mayor North suggested a TV. She came over and gave me some input because we get a lot of children in there and they're sitting in there on the sofa sometimes watching, you know, doing, just being entertained and while their parents are being interviewed in the other room and sometimes they can hear that and it stresses them out. So we got a TV, um, Reggie did that. He, he, their, their business, um, Kingsburg Media, donated the TV, which was really nice. He set it up so you can only watch Disney Plus on it. So we don't have to worry about them getting on the news or watching something inappropriate. Um, so that was a, a nice addition. There's a rug on the floor there that's for the kids to play with their cars. It's a fun little thing. There's the magnetic boards again, you can see. And of course, the alligator. That's the small love, love seat that we have in there. Um, it's about the same size as all that they had in there for the adults to sit on before. And then we have table in there, it's got a charger for their cell phones and, and things. And this is the larger sofa so that we can get more of a family in there. On the wall, I'm not sure how this shows. Okay, let me go back. Will it go back? Yeah, Okay. Uh, so there's a mirror up there. I don't know if you can see that very well. I said, kids love to look at themselves in the mirror, especially teenagers. We need a mirror in there. My husband thought I was crazy, but I got a mirror in there. <laughs> and uh, let's see, where's, oh, there's the backpacks again. There's a measuring stick. My husband says, why do you want that in there? Not to be picking on my husband, but <laughs> he just doesn't understand. And I said, the kids love to measure themselves. I mean, you know, kids want to see how tall they are. And uh, so we got that in there. And... Um, that's pretty much it. So we've, it's been used. Chief says he's walked by and seen the kids in there playing with the stuff. And um, I feel real happy about the way it turned out and very positive. Um, kids are going to get a lot of pleasure out of it, as much pleasure as you can get sitting in a police department. Any questions? If you ever come down to the PD, ask to go in and see the room. I just want to say thank you. Oh, you're welcome. That's a lot of work and mm -hmm. effort and thought. And you, you said you're a grandma? I am a grandma. Okay, well, you know, that's perfect. You know, there's the different age varieties, right? Yeah. The color books are up there in the mirror. It's just all the thought that you put into that. Thank and I know, she was, I know you were picking on your husband, but thank you, too, for <laughs> all of the uh, help that you contributed. And it's, I, I had brought up this question. I couldn't remember if we had gone through with this project or if it had happened. So I'm very thankful for this update because um, – it is really important for them to feel comfortable, even in a very uncomfortable situation yeah. in this yeah. time. So thank you so much. Oh, you're That's very welcome. Thing. I love the colors. Too. Oh, thank Purple's you. one of my favorite colors. <laughs> well, I did that right then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, no more questions? Just okay. no, thank you. I mean, yeah. it's a good project. Everyone knows that. But I, you can tell that your heart went into it, which mm -hmm. makes it a lot a lot better than I think thank you. it could ever have been. Yeah, so thank, thank you for you. your volunteering. Thank, thank you. you, Chief Taylor, <laughs> yep. for the manual labor. It was forced upon you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to also recognize uh, publicly Barbara Taylor and um, Chief Taylor for their continued service to this community, which just seems endless. And um, she is a gem, <laughs> and she did a great, a great job there. And, and the, the kids love it. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Too. Thank you. I just got to put some snacks in there. There's snacks in there. Got to go take some. That's right. Okay. 6.4, City Engineer Project Progress Report. Report by City Engineer Dave Peters. Presentation by City Engineer David Peters. Man, good evening. I uh, wanted to kind of update you on some of the some of the projects we're working on. Um, First, the, our capital improvement projects are moving forward. A um, couple of projects that I know you guys are, have heard about before are actually uh, getting ready to break ground. Um, the extension of the bike path on Madison Avenue, that's out to bid. Um, some of the vines have all been cleared. Uh, right away has been cleared, so we're, uh, we're expecting to start uh, construction on that in early May. And it should be done by close, uh, close to around Memorial Day. 
The, uh, our roundabout at Bethel and Sierra is also uh, out to bid. It will, um, it will open about the middle of April, and so you'll, you'll be seeing those projects come back to you for award. Um, and we expect to get started on construction on that in May with uh, anticipating completing it before, um, before the, the end of the summer. Um, we're also uh, <clears throat> in the right-of-way acquisition phase of the 18th Avenue sidewalk, so all the design is done. Uh, this is the first, the first phase, so it's from um, Tulare to Stroud. It's on the uh, west side. So all the design's been done. We've already contacted all those property owners once um, to, you know, and, and the impacts to a lot of the yards is just a couple of feet. Um, but some of those yards do have improvements that go all the way out to the curb, so there's some reconfiguration that needed to be done. So we talked through them once about how we would do that. Now we're going back to them to show them the final design and to um, execute the right-of-way acquisition. So that... Um, uh, we're hoping to get that uh, completed in the next few months, go out to bed and get started on construction uh, in the summer. Uh, the Madison Avenue Street um, reconstruction project was just completed, so that was from Sierra to Stroud, and we do have another project in the works to do the next phase, which would be Stroud all the way up to CAM. So that's you know probably another year out before we can go to construction, but that is... Uh, that is in the works. We're also getting ready to um, finalize our design and put out to bid our streets project, which are the, the streets you, you approved in last year's budget, 7th Street from Maylert to Roosevelt, Ventura Street from 10th to 18th, and Nevada Street from 6th to 10th. So those streets will also be under reconstruction very soon. Some of the development projects, um, first one, you know, I'm sure you heard a lot about Lanaya Villas um, that I wanted to highlight. We're Actually, I believe the latest I heard was tomorrow the polls are coming out on Sierra Street. So the polls and the overhead line will finally come out. It's been done in three phases. PG&E had to do work first. Then AT&T had to do work. And Comcast is the last one to come in. So if those polls come out tomorrow, um, that, would, that would be a that would celebrate. And then we're going to be able to complete the street and, uh, and the landscaping improvements and, and, and have, that, uh, have that project completed by early April. If it doesn't happen tomorrow, <laughs> we'll be on the phone making sure it does. So there's just, there's been a lot of delays, utility delays on that project. Um, and there's a, the third phase of the uh, West Star uh, residential tract has has is underway as well. So that there's um, four approved phases already. So the first one was south of Cam at 18th. And then the next one was directly north of CAM, and so now they're on phase three, which is north of that tract. So they're continuing to move north with that housing um, development. And then uh, on your agenda tonight, you approved track 6141, which is on north of, uh, of CAM, west of Academy. So there'll be another construction. It's kind of northwest of the uh, community partners um, project that's, that's finishing up. Uh, we're working with a developer to re, um, redevelop the San Clair gas station right over there at uh, Golden State and Sierra, St Sierra Street. So um, they're planning to just kind of redo the whole thing. So I think we're getting close to be able to, uh, to approve that site plan and, and move forward with that project. Um, and we're also in the plan check phase on the Union 76 gas station and Rayford Johnson Drive in Sierra. That was approved last year. So those projects are moving forward. Um, A couple of other projects we're working on, we're um, in, uh, impro uh, working on updating our improvement standards, so that should be before you, um, targeting April, to have a, a revised set of improve improvement standards before council for, uh, for review and approval. We're also um, completing the, our water uh, model update, so that's the, hydro uh, the, uh, the electronic water model of our, hydraulic water model of our water system, so it will tell us what, what, uh, what deficiencies we have and what we need to improve in our system. Uh, we've already done some work on this, but we're kicking off the hard design phase of uh, remodeling the, PD, the police station. So we have a kind of a kickoff meeting with the architect and the chief next week. So that's kind of an exciting project. Um, Golden State Boulevard reconstruction, you've heard about that. It's been going on for years. I don't even know how many, maybe 10. But the, I just wanted to update you. The latest um, I'm hearing on, in terms of the schedule is that it'll go to construction in summer of 2023. So 
We have to wait one more year. There's still um, there's still in negotiations with the railroad trying to get permits to do all the crossings and finalizing some right of way acquisition. So um, we're also working on a project to put um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons at four crosswalks on Sierra Street from uh, Draper right there at Memorial Park all the way down to we're hoping to have a new one installed at uh, Madsen and Sierra Street. So there's there's three there's three that are already existing crosswalks and then we're, we're trying to add a new one. So we're developing the design on that project. Uh, we just submitted a um, a grant. So you remember we did our, our downtown Kingsburg strategic plan that was funded through a transit oriented development grant. So it had a lot of components. We just submitted a grant um, for kind of the first phase of, of some of those improvements, which are bike lanes and doing um, uh, pedestrian improvements at the intersections. And I was just notified earlier today that we've been asked to come and present at their to their scoring committee. So I'm hoping that's a good thing. But um, so we'll be doing that next week. Um, and that's all I have. That's the highlights of my report. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. You have a question? Yeah. Sinclair. Um, yeah. What exactly are they wanting to do there? Can you say? Yeah. I mean, they submitted a site plan review. I think we're close to approving it um it's very close um but yeah it's it's uh it's a new i think the whole site's gonna get yeah it's just the whole the building's gonna get uh demolished and moved the whole site's gonna get reconfigured i think they are gonna try to save and use a lot of the underground tanks because that's kind of a big deal to take those out and move them but uh but yeah i think everything above ground will be um will be new or at least that's the proposal so so you're saying they want that whole area where yeah it would expand and it would it would encompass the area that was currently or formerly the pub and sub so it yeah, take they, up they just tore it down recently yeah yeah so it'd be that whole that whole parcel would be would be developed so more more uh more fueling um stations a bigger convenience store i think they have some outside i'm happy to share the site plan with you but they have some out, outdoor like dining area, you know, tables and those sorts of things. I think that canopy was part of the proposal. So, yeah. Okay. Projects. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, would you go ahead? Your first. Is it really a no, it's okay. not related to that. Um, I have a question about the Golden State Boulevard reconstruction. Yeah. I've brought this up before, and I'm I'm really stretching here to squeeze this question in um, because. <laughs> It's where, in front of Deli Casa. I've mentioned where there's a bunch of dirt. Yeah. I would love to see parking right there instead. And where I know the railroad is. where the railroad is. Yes. And a part of this Golden State Boulevard reconstruction is that we have to have a lot of communication with the railroad. And I know it's Cog that's doing that, right? But is there any way that in these conversations, possibly, there can be some advocacy for? That yeah, we're working space. on that. So I've already okay. done some research, figured out where all the right of ways at. So I'm trying yes. to figure out how we can do that. And yeah, we are working on that. So, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it would be I'm part so of that project nice. or a separate city project. We're just trying to figure out the mechanics of how we would do that. Sure. And then sure. we can figure out how we how we get it funded or what 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 projects it's a part of. So. Didn't know if that could blend in yeah. because it is a part of. <laughs> the other side yeah no i understand yeah um it's yeah that that you, you mentioned downtown. that before and that was not i've definitely forgotten. mentioned it like three so, times yeah. and i i We're know and i apologize it. but yeah. no um, it's okay <laughs> i appreciate I'm your i'm glad work. you brought it up again yeah thank you so much yeah my question had to do the same thing the golden state reconstruction um when is that supposed to take place 2023 so they're anticipating bidding the job in the, the spring and then they would start construction in the summer. The project has been split into three separate bid packages. Uh, I'm not sure if they're planning to bid all three and do all three at one time, or if they're going to, you know, stage do phase one first and phase two, phase three. So Kingsburg is phase one. So I guess yeah, that's okay. Thing. But yeah, okay. The reason I think I, they're still working at the logistics of that. The reason I ask is because there's a safety issue. I brought it up before um, on Stroud, mm -hmm. right there where Sim Cal CNC is and, and right. Ag Design. Yeah. Um, just yesterday, I was coming back 
going back to work from lunch, you have two cars turning left immediately, going back towards town. You have people that are, then you have cars coming south. Yeah. They're turning in front of these cars, and they're supposed to go around, and then you have other cars going around. Yeah. Because there's there's no lines on the road, on in the median there. And, yeah, so and that's whole, been going on for years. That whole intersection is getting reconstructed. Stroud, yeah. Stroud actually come in, comes into Golden State like this now, right? If this is Golden State, Stroud kind of comes in like this. So it's being bent, and it's going to line up directly across from the CNC driveway, yeah, and it's going to be signalized. So my my concern is, but right now, if that's not going to happen until 2023, yeah, you know, um, I've had the owners come to me and ask me, hey, can we get some uh, – some, well, lines drawn, you know. Yeah, some restriping. Uh, some maybe. striping, yes, thank you. Some Daniel and street I can go striping. Look at that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, because it's very dangerous, yep. Sarah. I mean, it happens almost daily. Yeah, we can get we got people there. turning. If it's just simply a striping issue, we can. I think we can take care of that. Okay. Yeah, I know that uh, Josh and Nick would be happy to hear that. Yeah. Because <laughs> they've, been, they've been asking me I'll, I'll, about that, you know. Yeah. I'll, I'll get with our public works director and we'll. Okay, thank Look you. Look at that, huh? Uh, any other questions for Dave? Oh, sure. Well, no. I'll ask later. It's not related to this question. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dave. Okay, 6.5. Solid waste rate study and Prop 210 update. Sponsor Public Works. Presentation by Lekowitz and... Sang Municipal Consultants. Did I say there.
school requirements are that the city should conduct a rate study um, to identify the actual cost of doing um, providing the service. The city is required to mail a notice to all affected rate payers, the property owners, letting them know that the city um, has conducted a study and has intended to uh, adjust the rate and that a public hearing will be held. And the notice must be mailed to rate payers um, at least. homeowners and ratepayers have the opportunity to submit a, 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 a vote saying that they protest the rate, they do not agree with the rate, and if more than 50% of the people who were mailed notices reply back that they protest the rate base, the rate cannot be adopted. Um, if folks do not mail protests in, uh, then the, the rate change could, could be adopted. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is number of your, your close um, neighboring agencies are also served by Mid-Valley Disposal, um, so Exeter, Zanger, and Reed Lee. And so uh, Kingsburg is, is right in the middle, has a very typical bill compared to other local agencies. Um, we did find that uh, Danuba and Selma are there, although those are served by um, a, different, a different franchise uh, holder. So this was, uh, that was
so this again just illustrates the same point that this is a solid waste fund ending balance. Um, this is negative. Uh, so the top of the chart there is actually the number zero, and then um, at the end of this fiscal year, we expect the fund balance to be negative about four hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. I even debated maybe that line should be red instead of blue. Um, <laughs> so if there was no rate adjustment. So to wrap up, I want to um, just give you an update on um, Senate Bill 1383. Uh, it's new, new uh, regi uh, regulations <laughs> related to uh, recycling and organic disposal. Um, so the city must provide organic collection uh, services to residents and businesses. It must conduct outreach, um, develop ordinances, and monitor compliance. So Mid Valley just in the past weeks or so has given us the new information about um, how the city will be provided these services and the cost associated with providing organic recycling. So in terms of timeline, um, the regulations have taken effect at the start of this new year. Um, we have two years for compliance and educational outreach and then uh, enforcement will begin. So we want to make sure that the, the rate structure is in place. Uh, we don't want two years to go by and then the city of Kingsburg is in trouble and has an put a rate structure that accomplishes, you know, this new service that they need to provide. We want to be in a good financial standing when enforcement does begin. And then the overall goal is to reduce um, waste and uh, edible food, um, you know, going into landfills. Next slide, please. So. Um, session just to start the conversation with you some preliminary info. Um, we'll continue to plug in uh, Mid Valley, Mid Valley's cost estimates into our financial model to get you some draft rates. And the plan is to come back in April to um, finalize the rate analysis and give you um, the, the rate study report. Uh, May would be the final recommendation and then in June we recommend um, conducting rate and again, uh, the rates for the fall waste fund have not increased in so long that we really want to make sure the public is aware of, of the process. And at that point, um, if the city is uh, supportive of the plan, can written mail be propositioned in 218 public hearing notices? There is a 45 day waiting period, and after that 45 days, uh, you can conduct the Prop 218 hearing. So, based on our initial schedule here, that would be August. The new rates could go into effect in September if there is no majority for that. That's what I have for tonight. Um, we are still working on crunching the numbers, uh, so I don't have any solid, um, solid, uh, you know, potential rate increases just yet. Um, but we are we're getting close, and so I'll come back next month um, to give you some draft recommendations. Questions? No, I don't have any. We're about to wait until we yeah. get yeah. all the costs and stuff before we have much more discussion. And I, I do appreciate the timeline. That's very helpful for us and the constituents. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Information only. Right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. So no action, just information, nope, okay. It was just informational, and uh, yeah. the Finance Committee will discuss the item, okay. too, as well. So okay. once we get those uh, numbers finalized. Can I ask a question? Um, uh, sure, yeah. Uh, those survey envelopes, are they going to be in a posted paid uh, envelope so that the citizens have to put their own stamp in the middle of the back? 
the Prop 218? So the, we have different options. Um, we'll have different options to be able to return it, both post is paid or you can walk in and drop it off. Um, you can actually even come to the meeting and protest it as well. So uh, different options, everything will be outlined uh, in the ballot that gets sent out. Um, so you'll have different options to be able to submit your vote. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Okay. Number seven, council reports and staff communications. 7.1, Community Services Commission. Uh, community Services meets ne next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. 7.2, Public Safety Committee. Uh, we met last Monday. Uh, Chief Dadian was there to give us some information and update on uh, body cameras for the police department and cameras for the vehicles and um, we, we had talked about giving them some funds for that project but they're still in the early stages so it's going to be another year or so so the committee ended up voting to give the give funds for more cameras for the city to put up in the city so we felt that was a need that uh, chief said there was also a need for to keep the public safe and keep crime low and for more cameras so we ended up voting for that more cameras so that was a good meeting Vince I listened in on that oh did you okay yeah it was a good meeting okay um, and that's it for, I have for that one um, Chamber of Commerce 7.3 nothing to report 7.4 economic development uh, economic development committee met on Monday uh, of this week uh, we discussed uh, the creation of a downtown mural program. Um, so we're working on uh, create, crafting some policy for that. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about the uh, electric vehicle infrastructure and potential locations for, for that in the downtown. And um, so we're working on cost estimates uh, for the design and uh, build out of that. So that was our discussion on Monday. Okay, thank you. 7.5 uh, Finance Committee. Uh, nothing to report. 7.6 Planning Commission. Uh, Planning Commission did not meet in March. 7.7 7, South Kings Groundwater Agency Joint Powers. We um, did not meet uh, lack of business, so okay. we'll meet next month. 7.9 COG. And Michelle's not here. Eight, but I have oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Seven point eight. Yeah, yeah, my bad. We meet next month. Nothing to report. Okay, thank you. Seven point nine. Cog. No, no, I don't. I don't have a council of governments up, update for you. Okay. Nothing to report. Seven point ten. Council member reports. I have nothing. I have nothing. Seven eleven. City manager's report. Uh, just a reminder: the spring cleanup. Uh, starts tomorrow, so it's three days uh, this week and then another three days uh, next week, next weekend as well. So it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and this week, and Thursday, Friday, Saturday next week. So Thanks. that's the free service for uh, city residents. They just have to bring their proof of residency um, if they live in town. So that's at Mid Valley Disposals Yard. Um, their yard? Yep. What are the times for that, do you know? I think there's 7 a.m. to 2.30 each day there's a flyer and it'll be in the carrier tomorrow as well um, and on the, it's on this uh, front page of the city's website as well uh, and then uh, just following up on our uh, our ARPA discussion our, our workshop that we had last week so we are developing or we did develop a um, survey uh, to get more community input and so that will be we'll be putting that out it'll start going out tomorrow with the carrier and then we'll put it on our social media platforms as well so that's all I have to report okay thank you uh, eight future agenda items. We have none. Does anybody have anything? I do not. Okay. Nine. The Kingsburg City Council adjourns out of the regular calendar into closed session. We have 9.1 conference with labor negotiators.